We got to realize that Jesus felt the pain. He felt the lying and, and the very persecution that the Pharisees were putting upon him. We got to realize at the end of the day that Jesus is our redeemer. But you got to look back to see where we came from to appreciate where we are. You better go back to the Garden of Eden and see where you were jacked up. You got to see where you are deserve to go to hell but God said I'll come to earth in the name of the Lord just for you when you give God some praise that he did it for you the Bible says he was wounded for our transgression I'm gonna give the Lord some
from the outer court, we're in the inner court, we're getting ready to go into his presence. Come on, clap those hands, don't get tired. Praise him with a hand clap. Praise him with a hand clap. Let me see you clap your hands. 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 If he's been good to you, you ought to be able to clap your hands. He's so good, so good. He's so good. Say, my Redeemer. He's my Redeemer. He's my Redeemer. Okay, put your Bibles down, your iPods, your iPhones, wherever you get the word. Just give the Lord a hand praise because he is our Redeemer. You may be seated in the presence of God as I hurry along. He is our Redeemer. I want to deal with redemption today. And we, we find that the, the word redeem in the Greek is the word apolytrosis, which simply means a releasing affected by payment of a ransom. How many know that Jesus paid the ransom for our lives with his life? Redemption deals with deliverance because all of us have been delivered from something. It's liberation, once again, that is procured by a payment of a ransom. You know, some people, when they get kidnapped, you know, the loved ones will have to sometimes pay a ransom. And it's usually in dollars and cents. But the Bible lets us know that Jesus paid our ransom with his 
life. It's it, redemption is being redeemed by one by paying the price. How many know that Jesus paid the price? I'm gonna let this hopefully unfold in a very unusual way, but I'm gonna want to point out to you that there are three qualities that God has. We all know that God is omnipotent. How many know he has all power? He's omnipresent. How many know he can't be taught anything? He, he's everywhere, I should suggest. That he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's in this room. He's, he's in Africa. He's, he's in Japan. He, he's in your house right now because God fills all space. So he's all powerful. He fills all space. But then there is a quality, there is a quality that God has that many times our carnality struggles with. And that is the quality of being omniscient and all-knowing God. Look at your neighbor and say, God knows everything. Sometimes it brings us to, if, if God knows everything, come on, let me see the hands that believe God knows everything. That's good, I'm preaching to a church now. I believe God. He knows everything. So if, if, if God knows everything, sometimes it brings questions in our mind. I just want to know if I'm talking to some real people. We may ask, why doesn't he intercept stuff? Why doesn't, why doesn't he just stop things from happening if he knows what's going to happen before it happens? Why doesn't he just cut the devil off at the path? Why don't he just make the brother, the sister go left? Why don't, why don't he just stop it before it happens? But how many know that God just doesn't stop everything that is coming at us? But we have to realize he puts us in a position to make the right choice. Oh, let the church say amen. I got a few amens on that. We have to realize that God is not in the business of stopping the devil from doing what he wants to do at times. But just be encouraged that the devil is on a short leash. We have to realize he doesn't force us to make decisions. However, he recommends uh, to us the decision that we should make that brings about the results that we want. Oh, I don't have a praise in church now because you, because we have to realize that God always suggests to us What's going to bring about the best results? Now let me tell you a little bit about us. We are free moral agents. That's how we were created. That means you have the ability, you have the wherewithal to make choices. The last choice you made, it was either the wrong choice or the right choice. How many have made some bad choices in your life? All of us have made bad choices. And I know some of you are saying, what in the world does this have to do with redemption? Yo, well, hold on just a little while. How did God create man? Once again, a free moral agent. He created a body, the Bible lets us know, out of the dust of the ground. He created a shell. He created what you look at in the mirror when he created Adam. Adam had everything you got. Two eyeballs, a nose, a mouth, two ears, you know, five you know, five fingers on each hand and five toes on each foot, your bodily organs. He had all, everything that there was needed. But there was one thing that he didn't have when he was initially created, and that was life. So God breathes into what he created out of the dust of the ground. The way God creates, he creates, he speaks to nothing, and it comes into existence. So he spoke to dust, dust becomes a man, but the man has no life. So he breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. So when the body and the, and the spirit came together, the soul was created. We are a tripartite being, meaning that we are three. What you look at in the mirror, you see one, but you're really three. Spirit, soul, and body. The spirit part of you is the highest part of you because it is God conscious. The soulish part of you is self-conscious. And the bodily part of you, the shell that you live in, is world conscious. If you put your hand on a hot stove, your body 
draws back. But the Bible lets us know that the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh part of us is what? Weak. So when the enemy attacks you, he doesn't attack the God so much in you, but he attacks the weakest part of you. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he becomes a living soul. We have to be mindful because we can make choices. We either choose God's way or we choose the devil's way, and there's no in between. But when it comes to sin, we play the blame game. Adam played the blame game. I'm going to get that earlier in a minute. He pointed at his wife when he blew it. Let the women say amen. amen. Adam is the originator of the blame game. And even though we have the, the wherewithal to make the right choice, this is going to get me in trouble. Because many times we say it wasn't nothing but the devil. No, it was you. You wanted to do it. You made the decision. You liked it. You wanted the pleasure. Oh, I know this ain't popular on a communion Sunday morning, but I'm going to preach it anyhow. God is always going to lead us in the right direction. Listen to this. Before we fall into sin. He has given you the power over the devil to say no. Oh, I got a few amens in here. I'm feeling good now. We have to obey God just because it is right. Obeying God's word and being in God's will. How many know that's a good place to be? We have to realize that the way that we are created is for a reason. God didn't create us robots. He created us, once again, free moral agents. Could you imagine if the Lord would have created an android? An automaton? You know, he would have created us, uh, you know, uh, an R2-D2 C-3PO type. Those are characters from Star Wars, just to let you know, robots from Star Wars. He would have had a praise button. He would have had an obedience button. He would have had a thanksgiving button. He would have had a prayer button. He would have had a come to church button, a be faithful button, be accountable button, be responsible button, do what I say, do button, and don't ask no question. But how many know when you obey God just because it is right, he gets all the praise, he gets all the glory at the end of the day. I dare you to obey God. So let me take you to the Garden of Eden. God gives man everything that is needed. He creates him in his image and his likeness. Guess how we're created? In his image and his likeness. That's a hook up there. Created by God. Don't know nothing but God. Created in the dispensation of since we don't know good nor evil. We don't, the Adam didn't know what it was to be jealous. He didn't know what it was to have a click because he was all by himself. But then the Lord says, I'm not only going to create you, but I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to put you in the garden of Eden. Place where the vegetation just comes up on his own. Don't have to till the ground. Access to water. Access to, to, to perfect temperature. Just keep it and dress it and name everything that I put in it. Sounds like a job to me. But he tells him, don't eat from the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. Because the Lord tells him these are the parameters. If you eat from the tree of knowledge and of good and evil, you will surely, positively, absolutely, without question, die. Now you got to remember that Adam is in, in an in, he's in an incorruptible body. No sin, no sickness, no disease, no gym membership. No gross 
ghost restored. No, no, can't be suggested to do wrong. He's just in perfect, absolute communion with God. Then he sees that, that you know, he creates, God creates the, the animals, looks at Adam's situation, and says it's not good for man to live alone. Let me help you. Let me go get you. Y'all, sometimes we say that God does everything. God can do anything. You know what God suggested not to do? I'm not going to fill the void. The voids that this man needs, I'm not going to fill them with myself. I'm going to fill him. I'm going to fill, I'm going to meet his needs with a woman. He creates her. We know the story. Out of a rib, puts him to sleep. He's an anesthesiologist one minute. He's a surgeon the next minute. He creates the next minute. He brings them together and says, I'll be the preacher. He marries them. And they become one flesh. He says, leave your mom and daddy. That was for us. And cleave to one another. I'm running out of time here. So the very fact that he puts parameters in the garden says don't eat from the tree of knowledge and of good and evil. He creates the woman but the serpent. You know I'm cut to the chase here. I, gotta, I can't teach all this today. But the serpent comes who is subtle, more subtle, has more trickery, more cunning than any beast. And he comes to the woman and says if you eat from that tree you won't surely die. How many know that the enemy is always trying to change God's word? You won't surely die. How many know that the God we serve, he doesn't give figures of speech. He says what he means and he means what he says. She eats because she was tricked. She was beguiled. She was run amok. She fell for it, y'all. But when she ate, guess what happened? Nothing. But when Adam ate, everything changed. Man, y'all better start saying amen in here. Brothers, look at one another and say, don't blame Eve. <laughs> Whenever we sin, it becomes an issue. It becomes an issue of the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. It looked good for food. And then Satan turns around and tells her, for God does not know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Genesis 3 and 5. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, the pride of life. How many know that pride will get you in trouble? Don't you let the devil ever suggest that if you do something out of God's will, you're going to be big up. Don't you ever let the devil suggest that you're going to be a wonder without God. Don't you ever let the devil suggest that you can do it without God. That you'll be anointed without God. That you'll be prosperous without. You will look prosperous, but you will end, you will end up jacked up. Yeah, I said jacked up. So here it is. When Adam falls in the sin, God had to have a plan to get man out of his mess. So that's why I started this out. We struggle with the omniscience of God. Why didn't God stop Adam? Why didn't God say, devil, just leave him alone? Number one, it would have corrupted his word. Number two, he would never receive any glory out of us. 
God does not receive glory by forcing us to do anything. Anybody in here ever run from God? You was running, he was telling you what his hands went up slow there. That's all right, I'll just lift my hand. You just, you know, you did what you wanted to do. You did it how you wanted to do it. In the name of the Lord, you just ran from the Lord. But how many know that God saw what you were going to do before you did it? And we're no different than Adam. So we have to realize he had to have a method to bring us back to himself. God's mission has been redemption from the time of the fall. That redemption was going to come through a blood sacrifice. We find that Adam is penalized. The consequences of his action is he would have to till the ground to make things grow. I got to get through here. The wife, his wife, was going to have to experience travail in childbirth. That's why your wife wanted to choke you when she was in labor. In the name of, that's why she wanted to grab you around your throat and choke you and say, this is what you did to me, Adam. Because it was the penalty of sin. The reason why we work from the sweat of our brow is because of sin. But I thank God for his plan of redemption. So God had to get us out of our mess. The only way he was going to get us out of our mess is he was going to have to send someone to get us out. Now let me have a conversation with you. Now we know that God is perfect. If he's omniscient, he never has to make a decision. He always knows what he wants to do. Right? knows what he wants to do. But let's just say God had to think. What am I going to do? How am I going to get this man out of this issue that he's put himself in? I've given him everything that he needs. But the bottom line is that Jesus, that God was going to have to become man. Hebrews 2 and 9 says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of the death crowned with the glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of God, and as God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in all the world, or in, all in the world, and received up into glory, which lets us know that God had to become man. But we got a problem here. God is a spirit. How many know you can't touch a spirit? You can't see a spirit. So if God were to look around and try to find a candidate, None of us would qualify because all of us have issues. The Bible says we, we have all been born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So if God had to look around and find a candidate, he would find none. This one would find God scratching his head. The Bible says that he repented that he made man. That doesn't mean that God repented like we do. When we repent, it's godly sorrow. But when God repents, it's when he has blessed us and he's given us everything we need and we still do the wrong thing. And he goes, oh. Every time we disappoint God, he sighs. So we find that no one qualifies, so God has to come to earth himself. There's still a problem because he needs to become man. When we look at the qualifications of a redeemer, the redeemer, number one, he had to be a man, but he had to be a kinsman. That means he had to be related to all mankind. God is related to all of us because he is spirit. He had to be sinless. He had to be a Jew. He had to be willing and he had to be able. So God lowered himself for us so that we could be redeemed. The Bible says that for God loved us so much, he gave the very best that he had. 
Oh, you ought to be praising the Lord in here. He gave us himself, but himself had to be incarnated in flesh. So the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Oh, glory to God. Why did he give? Because he knew that we needed to be redeemed. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible lets us know that he would become man. How would he come into the world just like you and me? He would have an earthly mother by the name of Mary. Oh, glory to God. I know I'm in Christmas too quick for some of y'all, but I'll preach it all over again if I have to. In the name of the Lord, he comes to a virgin, a woman that did not know a man who was engaged to a man by the name of Joseph. Oh, you ought to praise the Lord in here. So the Bible lets us know to cut to the chase. We know that Jesus came through, hallelujah, the birth canal of a human being, but he was not born of a seed of a man. He was born of a seed of a woman. The Bible lets us know that his name shall be called Emmanuel or oh, oh, you want to praise the Lord in here which means that God is with us so when Jesus came into this earth he was God manifested in the flesh that mean that the very fact he was all God and all man at the same time he wasn't 50% man and 50% God but he was 100% man and 100% God which lets us know that his body felt pain his body felt disappointed he had emotional issues because the Bible says he would come unto his own and his own would receive him not don't you worry when you're rejected by someone when you're rejected by your family when you're rejected by your friends your so called friends but how many know if Jesus was rejected we're going to be rejected Isaiah 53 says these words in the third verse he was despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief which lets us know that the Lord knows what we're going through he knows how heavy it is but Peter said it like this cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you you ought to give God a praise in here the Bible said we hid it as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not that means his visage was marred more than any man why because we had to be redeemed by the power of his blood we got to realize that Jesus felt the pain he felt the lying and, and the very persecution that the Pharisees were putting upon him we got to realize at the end of the day that Jesus is our redeemer but you got to look back to see where we came from to appreciate where we are you better go back to the Garden of Eden and see where you were jacked up. You got to see where you deserve to go to hell. But God said, I'll come to earth in the name of the Lord just for you. Will you give God some praise that he did it for you? The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed oh you ought to praise him that he laid down his life for you I don't believe that Jesus was murdered I don't believe he was assassinated I don't believe he was set up I don't believe there was a bounty on his head but in the reality is he laid down his life life for you. If, do you know anybody that would lay down their lives for you today? Don't look at your neighbor. Hallelujah. You got to be put in that situation first. Don't look at you. Don't look behind you. Don't think that they'll die for you. They'll say it now but when they get in that situation that's a decision that can only be determined at that moment. Look at Jesus. He would be denied. He would be betrayed. Teased. He would be interrogated, be mocked, he would be beaten, he would be whipped, he would be abused, he would be ridiculed, he'd be scorned, he would be treated like a dog before he went to the cross. He was carried from prison to prison, from judgment hall to judgment hall. He, was, he had to carry his own cross. 
and you see him carrying the cross on his back in the name falling down and skinning his knees and the dirt on the road getting into the brush burns on his knees getting up and stumbling oh you want to praise God in here because some of you act like God ain't done nothing for you but you got to realize that Jesus paid the price for you and he did it with his life the Bible lets us know in the name of the Lord that no greater love has a man than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends I come to tell you that you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb the Bible says that the lamb this lamb was slain before the foundation of the world I don't know when I get up in the morning if I ain't got nothing to praise God for I can praise him because I've been redeemed oh come on you need to thank God in the name of the Lord that in your sin sick state he said I won't leave you alone I'll never leave you nor forsake you but I'll be with you always even until the end of the earth and on this communion Sunday I'm so glad that Jesus lifted me he lifted me because he was lifted so I could be redeemed I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb the Bible says in Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for it is written Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. We were cursed, but Jesus died so we could be blessed. Hallelujah. When you were in the world, you were cursed. Folk wrote you off, but God wrote you in. When you were in the world, you were on your way to hell, but Jesus hung on that tree and he took every curse in his body. The Bible lets us know that he that knew no sin, he became sin. Hallelujah. He became everything he was not so that we could be what he is. Does anybody feel like praising God? Because you know you've been redeemed. Hallelujah. He was made sin for us. He was made sickness for us. He was made disease. He knew what it was to be a liar. He knew what it was to be a cheater. He knew what it was to be a thief. He knew what it was to have a heartache. He knew what it was to have a headache because crowns of thorns was on his head. He knew what it was to have an ache in the side because they threw a spear in his side. They drew nails in his hands and feet. They whipped him all night long. But I thank God at the end of the day I can say that Jesus is my redeemer. I want to tell some of you your wife is not your redeemer. Your husband is not your redeemer. Your boyfriend is not your redeemer. Your girlfriend is not your redeemer. Your homies ain't your redeemer. But Jesus, he is your redeemer. He's the only one that can bring you out of darkness. He's the only one that can bring you out of the gutter. He's the only one that can bring you out of your struggle. You might as well stop covering it up and give it to Jesus. Jesus knows what you're going through. It's time for somebody to give him praise like he's a redeemer. Hallelujah. And because you're redeemed, he'll redeem you from the hand of the enemy. I say what David said, no one hosts would encamp against me. My heart would not fear. No war would rise against me. In this will I be confident. Why? Because he 
3.15 We find the promise of the Redeemer How many know that your Redeemer liveth? The Bible says It says that I will put enmity Between the woman between thy seed and her seed, oh glory to God, he put enmity between the devil and the woman, and this seed, hallelujah, will bruise the head of the devil, hallelujah, but the devil will bruise Jesus' heel when you hit somebody in the head, if you hit them hard enough, they're going to die. If they hit you in the heel, you live to preach another day. You live to give God the glory the other day. But Jesus came to the earth, hallelujah, to free us from the power and the penalty of sin. He purchased your sins on Calvary. The worst thing you ever did was nailed to the cross. Nobody saw it but you. But Jesus said, I'll die for it. How many know that all of us got some skeletons in the closet? You ought to give God some praise in here. You've got some skeletons. But if you said, Lord, forgive me, the skeleton is under the blood of Jesus. Some of y'all need to confess so that you can receive the power of redemption. Will somebody take about 30 seconds and give God some praise for the blood that was shed on Calvary? I feel like blessing him. What about you? I feel like rejoicing. What about you? Our God is an awesome God. And when he blesses us, hallelujah, we should talk about it. We should praise about it. We should testify. Hallelujah. The choir sung his beloved. It still works. Oh, if you're sick, I want to tell somebody the beloved. 
filled with the Holy Ghost, we would never know that you've been redeemed. Get off your hands. Stop having a pity party. Stop crying and whining. And raise up and tell the devil, look him in the face. I've been through the fire, but I shall not be burned. I've been through the water, but it won't overtake me. They thought I would die, but I'm a lie. They thought I would lose, but I'm a winner. They may have left you, but Jesus is your redeemer. Jesus is the one that paid the price. Tell your neighbor, wake up. You got to know who you are. At the end of the day, you're a son of God. At the end of the day, you're a king's kid. At the end of the day, you're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. The show for praise of the one that brought you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Give God some praise. Y'all better praise him in here. My Redeemer living. Bless him in here. Uh-uh. Y'all need to think about what God has done for you. See, if y'all let it settle in your heart, you've been redeemed. Y'all don't need me to help you praise God. Y'all don't need me to praise God for you. You don't need no rock to praise God for you. You can praise God for yourself. Why are we praising him this morning? Because Jesus is my redeemer. Jesus is your Redeemer, Jesus is your Redeemer. Somebody going to leave this place knowing you've been redeemed. Take communion? No. Do you know 
the significance of the atoning, sanctifying, cleansing, washing, restoring, preserving power of the blood. When you, when you eat that bread, you should hear the crack of a whip. When you eat the bread, you should hear the nails being driven in his hands and feet. When you eat the bread, you should see the thorns that were penetrated into Jesus' skull. You should see the flogging. They didn't whip Jesus with the whips that we see in the circus. They beat him with a whip that had several strands of leather laced with chips of bone and metal. So when it hit Jesus, it would rip the flesh and expose bone and tissue and bodily organs. We say things like, I came to church with a headache. Leave me alone. Jesus had a headache too. His feet were aching. He was losing blood. He was dehydrated. We got to be more thankful for our redemption. The price that Jesus paid. Anybody just thankful that you've been redeemed? Put your hands together. and rejected of men. Man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his sharers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. 
And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put on him to grieve. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall come in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto them. And he was numbered with the transgressions, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgression. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you at this time. We thank you for your blood. We're thankful that you redeemed us from the penalty and the bondage of sin. We declare that your blood has made us whole. If anyone is sick among us, you are able to heal. Let faith be released, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your blood that will never lose its power. We honor you as we prepare to eat from your table. We glorify you. We magnify you for all that you've done. The nails driven in your hands and feet. The crown of thorns on your head. The spear that was thrown in your side. We're thankful that you loved us enough to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We honor you, Lord. And we praise your name in Jesus' name. Let everyone repeat after me. Lord, forgive me of all of my sins. The sin of commission and the sin of omission. Lord, count me worthy to partake of the elements of communion. I thank you for your broken body. I thank you for your shed blood. In Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, who brought me out that day. And while I am here tonight, I'm going to give the Lord some.